we did have a great question from the audience, and that is, what if when you bought plants for a job, Cactus Jack meaning, he bought plants for a job, but what if they were on sale and he bought more plants than he needed? But he needed half of the plants that he bought for the current job. We're still talking about the job in January. But he bought 20 plants in anticipation that the 10 plants he didn't use for January, he would use in a job in February. So, great question. If you have not used those plants for a job, meaning you didn't perform a service, you didn't plant the plants and bill the customer, does that whole bill belong to January? No. And the answer was no. The bill belongs half in January and half in a future period in the period which he uses them. So, in this case, 10 of his plants are booked to inventory. 10 of his plants are booked to cost of goods sold. Now, those 10 plants that go into his inventory, they don't reflect on the profit and loss at all. He did not build them out. He did not sell the plants. He didn't plant the plants. And so now he has a live inventory somewhere. So, in February, his main goal is going to be to sell those 10 plants. And when he does sell those 10 plants, yes, then they go to cost of goods sold, and the earnings from that job are going to be reflected in the February profit and loss statement. So, what we're talking about now is the balance sheet, and we're talking about inventory. His plants went into inventory. They did not go to cost of goods sold. And when you have things in inventory, you have work in progress. You have work or inventory in anticipation of a future job. Now, work in progress in school is largely an example of manufacturing. It talks about raw materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead, but it's the same concept when you talk about work in progress for any company. It's the work that is in progress for a future sale. So, he might have work in progress direct labor because he paid someone to unload those plants and put them in his inventory. That cost of labor will be stored here until he sells those plants. He also has direct overhead involved with his inventory because in this case, he has to store those plants. He rents the place that he stores plants. So now we have a cost of inventory overhead that involves the asset that he bought, the plants, direct labor, direct materials, which may also include plants plus fertilizer, and then also the overhead involved in storing that inventory till his next job, and it's called work in process, and it's on the balance sheet, not the profit and loss statement. So, in this case, we wait until he sells the inventory to book it to the profit and loss statement or invoice it out or etc. pay for it. When he does pay for it though, if he does have to pay for it before he bills it, it still goes to the balance sheet work in process inventory and not cost of goods sold. It is not a cost of goods sold until it's sold. So if that is a um, a little bit confusing for some people. We can talk about this again. I'm going to give another example. We'll go over this again. And if you're feeling a little bit nervous right now about the mechanics of the balance sheet and working process and the inventory and all of that, don't worry. It's not that complicated. And we will get to a point where you're very comfortable with this topic before the class is over. So let's get to back to the profit and loss statement. Um, there are other things to consider 
below the line, which we talked about before, below the line is still very important because it is the cost of keeping your business running. It's not necessarily the cost of a job. And when I was looking at Cactus Jack's construction profit and loss statement, I saw something that stood out to me in a large way. It stood out to me because a lot of business owners make this mistake. They think that because you have W-2 wages, they all have to go into below the line W-2 payroll rate wages. This is a common mistake because if part of your W-2 wages are used to sell a job or to perform a job, then those W-2 wages actually belong above the line because if you have costs for a job buried inside your overhead, remember this is general and administrative costs below here, if you do have job costs buried into a line item that is largely overhead, you will be missing some information that you need to know as far as your cost of goods sold. If part of your cost of goods sold are down here, are you really making 25% gross margin? No, you're not, you're making less. And so if you thought your gross margin was good and you thought everything was great, you missed an opportunity to learn something because your payroll wages that pertain to people who perform services and jobs that result in a sale for your company, those wages, even if they're W-2, they belong up here. That's an operational expense and it belongs to your operational understanding. So in this case, I made a correction because I know this company so well, I made a correction and I moved the job W-2 expenses up to where it belongs. And so now my payroll wages below the line are only administrative W-2 wages. It belongs to salaries of managers or salaries of office personnel, it could be your controller salary or your CEO salary, your VP salary, people that aren't hands-on performing a job to sell. So once I took out all of the job labor from this line and moved it up here and recalculated my percentage, now I understand my gross margin is only 19%. Is that still a good percentage? Well, it depends. It's still a good percentage if your bottom line is green, but if your percentage is 19% and your bottom line is negative, I would focus on how to get this number up. Because once you get this number up, that will help you take care of all of these other expenses below the line that are more static or more fixed or more constant and not variable directly with sales and sales jobs and the performance of jobs. But in this case, if that was the only correction I made for this company on the profit and loss statement, if that's the only thing I corrected, then the bottom line, of course, wouldn't have changed. It would have just shifted my understanding of how much I'm making on the top line. So, once you get the understanding of your top line, and it's a good understanding, meaning you've swept your profit and loss statement, and you've made corrections like the one I just found, and now you've loaded your top line to include everything that you should rightly include in a perspective of job performance. Now I have bond expense, permit inspection fees, equipment rental, and W-2 labor. I have it all here. And so now my understanding of 19% is a more complete understanding. And with a more complete understanding, I can then now try to peel away the onion and figure out how to increase my margin 
because when I can increase my margin and everything below the line stays relatively constant, that's where I'm going to enjoy a big boost in profit margin at the bottom, meaning my net income is going to increase as much as the top line increases, the bottom line will increase also. And in this case, I'm actually also showing you a transitional profit and loss statement between January and February is what we're looking at. And between January and February, I started at 19%, and then I changed some profit uh, metrics in here, I decrease some costs, and when I decrease some costs because I made some managerial decisions and operational decisions about my business and my business performance, once I knew I was at 19%, I made some decisions, I cut some costs, and my revenue went up a little bit also. So this shows you how the understanding as a whole allows you to drill down now into performance patterns that happen between month over month and comparing now the importance of comparing period over period over period as it relates to your benchmark. So now that I know that my operational margin is only 19% and I really want my operational margin to be 25% so that I know I have plenty of room in the bottom to take care of my ongoing operational overhead. Um, now that I know that, then my next step is to take my end of year, 2022, divide everything by 12, and use those numbers as a benchmark. In order to take information and make decisions from it, meaning use your information for actionable intelligence, you have to have a benchmark. You have to have a place from, to start from and to compare to. So in this case, I'm starting with static numbers in my January column. And now that I'm in February with Cactus Jack, I'm taking my end of February actual numbers from the close period and I'm comparing it now to a month over month comparison of how I did last year on average as a whole as compared to how I'm doing now currently in February. And this is with the correction that I had made to job labor on W-2s. So now that I have loaded my cost of goods sold section with everything that pertains to directly to a job, meaning if I have a job, I have these costs. If I don't have a job, I don't have these costs. Now that I look at February, well, it looks that I increased my sales in February, but everything else remained pretty much the same. I increased my top line. Everything here stayed the same. Therefore, my percentage went up. So yes, increasing your sales and keeping your job costs the same will give you a higher margin. How do you think Cactus Jack did that though? Could it be that he had overbought his inventory in January and saved it on his balance sheet and then enjoyed that cost savings from January because he got to sell the same inventory in February, maybe for the same price, maybe for a little bit more volume, but his cost stayed the same. His cost in relation to his sales actually went lower. If, if everything else is the same and your sales are higher and all of this thing all of these numbers trickle down through to the fact that you had inventory already previously bought and the only thing that changes is volume, then guess what? 
you enjoyed a higher profit margin because you made a strategic business decision and you capitalized on your ability to buy plants at a great price in, in January. It worked out for him great. But he knows that is only because of what he did in January. What's going to help him in March? We still have to get down further into the details of this if we want to make an ongoing and lasting increase to our profit margin. So here's an example of now what happened in March. This is still January the same. That's our benchmark. These are not actual numbers. It was last year divided by 12. So now I'm comparing March to January and April to January. In March, my sales stayed the same as compared to January. The only thing that changed is my costs decreased. So if my sales stay the same, my costs decrease, I still enjoy an increase in profit margin. So that's great. But what about April? In April, my sales went back up to 700 and my costs decreased, so I enjoyed both an increase in sales and a decrease in costs. Look what that did to my margin. Now I'm at 31%. Now, assuming everything below the line stayed the same, what happened to my bottom line? It went up every time. It went up in January because sales increased. It went up in March, or sorry, February, and then March. March because the cost went down. And then in April, we enjoyed both the increase in costs, increase in sales and decrease in costs. And now my margin's at 31%. Cactus Jack is doing very well now because he's paying attention to his numbers. So now, month over month is what we need to do now. Compare to your benchmark. For you, the benchmark may not be January. It may not be last year. Maybe this is mid-year for you. Use a benchmark. Start somewhere and then compare month over month how you're doing in comparison to that monthly benchmark where you started. And then enjoy the understandings then when your closed financials give you a confirmation that you're doing things right in the field or you still need to make some tweaks. So to understand the value of your dollars, more quickly, this is tip number five. Translate everything to a percentage, meaning take every important line item in your profit and loss statement and translate everything into a percentage because it's really hard to, in the field, on the go, try to make decisions of you know, plus or minus a hundred dollars here or a thousand dollars there. It's not only just important that you know sales increase your profit margin, reducing costs increase your profit margin. You have to also understand the value of what one percentage point means to your business. So in, in Cactus Jack's business, $700,000 of a top line multiplied by 1% is $7,000. So now he knows, he keeps that number in his head, $7,000, and then he takes 1% of cost of sales and he translates that into, let's make it round, $5,000. So now he knows if he increases something above 7,000 and below 5,000, those are his benchmarks in terms of one percentage point of the total value of his monthly sales. So now if you're a business owner and you know how much 1% is to you, what 1% what means to you, now, when you talk about buying things in bulk, 
and enjoying a bulk discount, you'll have to weigh the option between is the bulk discount worth a percentage to me, 2% to me, 3% to me, and or if I don't sell those plants and they die, then I didn't enjoy any increase in savings. So you have to weigh these things, but it's it, com it becomes a lot more easy to keep numbers in your head and understand things very quickly when things are presented to you as opportunities in the field when you're buying inventory, when you're when you're hiring labor or you know I can't use my W-2 labors this week they're on vacation now I have to subcontract. If you know how much one percentage is for your cost of sales as as compared to your top line then you can think in terms of every single job in terms of one point or one percent. That makes things very quick in the field. Your mind starts going a lot faster and you can make all these decisions much faster without having to go back and wait for a closed period financial. And at the end of the day, if your accounting group is slowing you down because you're waiting on financials and you're waiting on financials, um, this is not the way any business owner can glean actionable intelligence from financials if it takes 10 days to close a month you've missed 10 days of information in real time so that would be my last tip that i'm going to leave you with in the full understanding of what we've discussed is that if you don't have actionable intelligence in real time that also is not as helpful to you as a business owner